So some of you might have seen this online. Uh, this is on our, the homepage of the website. And NASPA is really happy to announce that we have a, established a partnership with the University of Toronto's Monk School of Government, which is in um, Toronto, Canada. And the Monk School of Government actually does all of the research and the prep work for the G20 um, in China uh, this fall. So we have a one paid internship that will only be open to competition students. So it will be a competitive process since there are uh, about 15 to 20 people on every team. Anyone who is interested will be able to do an interview and answer some questions about why they want this research opportunity. So it is a, uh, we'll pay for your travel to get to Canada uh, and you'll get a, a paid stipend to do research for a couple weeks or a month or two during the summer. So work hard. Uh, this is a pretty awesome prize. This didn't exist until we approached them. So this is not something that's being offered to the general public. It's only going to be open to the people who are on the winning team. So kind of a big deal, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. And the other prize, which I can't announce specific details about yet, um, there is a, a conference happening, which is focused on what happens after the COP21 Paris talks um, from December. So I am working on a prize that will be in conjunction with that conference that all of the people on the winning team will be able to attend. So this is something that will be attended by world leaders, literally from around the world, folks who are part of the UN staff and part of the implementation team and, and chiefs of staff, um, of which the, everyone on the winning team will be open to do it. So there's a lot of layers of bureaucracy that I have to get approval before I can announce any more details. But I want to throw that out there that that should be coming as well as long as, as, no, as nobody totally nixes the idea. Um, so we're really excited about that. And um, I got a couple questions about judging, which I just want to mention quickly. Um, if you didn't see Appendix C during the day, which outlines how you're judged overall, um, you're judged on three things. Um, so the first is your World Energy Score, which is from Task 2C, and that's 35% of your overall weight. The second thing is the judge's ratings. That accounts for 45% of your overall day, your day-to-day -day experiences. Um, and they graded you on tasks one through three, and they'll grade you again now on the presentation. And then the third part of the score is the 20% of your peer rating. And I'm going to echo what Lutz said. If you rate the other team zeros and you think that's going to outsmart the system, we're just going to toss, toss it out. So please rate honestly, um, rate fairly, um, and have fun. So thank you all for being here, and that's the prize. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We are the group The Change We Need, and today we're going to present our policy package to tackle down climate change. So, as we all know, uh, climate change is something uh, which is happening, it is a truth, and it's very bad, and we are all responsible for it. And we have to change our behavior, we have to change things, how we do them. And, but we as policymakers, of course, we cannot uh, change people's minds, we cannot uh, influence how people think and how they perceive the planet where they live. But we as policymakers, we have the responsibility um, to make policies which ease these developments and uh, which path the way towards a new way of thinking. And that's also why um, today we're going to uh, present our policy package. But what we actually want is much more. We have a vision, which is a vision of a more sustainable world where people as I already mentioned, change the way they behave and interact with this planet because we only, only have one planet. And uh, we hope that with our policy package, once implemented, we can um, create input and motivate uh, other policy makers to implement different other policy packages and you know, lead to more sustainable development. So here already you have a snapshot, snapshot of uh, what the outcome of our policy package would be, which is stabilization of temperature, high feasibility of the implementation of the package, consensus between actors, which is very important because we are here to discuss on how to implement this, and uh, don't want just to give you empty promises. Sustainable growth, it is a long-term package, 
and uh, more productivity and efficiency, and of course, uh, some sort of economic transformation. Well, that sounds really good, but now the question is, how are we going to do it? So let's start with the fact that it is a long-term package. We don't just bring to you a package that lasts for five years or 10 years, but that goes to a span of over 85 years. Now, what we have achieved is phenomenal. We are going to limit the temperature rise to 1.9 degrees from today, the day that we are all meeting in this room, till the year 2100, which is, and how are we going to do this? There are two things that are very key to making this policy package implementable. One is that we decrease the use of fossil fuels and we increase renewable energy and induce sustainable growth. Now in the policy that we have run and the simulations and the idea that we have developed, which my, part, which my teammate Mahmoud will be talking you through, we have actually ensured that the sustainable energy gets full uh, focus, so much so that it changes the present status quo that we see in society. Also, what is excellent about the package that we have devised is that it has a feasibility of 8.5, which means that all sectors all across the world and belonging to the G20 countries agree that this is feasible and they can be a part of it and achieve it politically and also domestically and internationally. And this is also going to be achieved through a very good relation between tax and GDP, which will also be dealt on later on in the slides, making sure that the growth is sustainable in the time duration that we are talking about. Now I'm going to hand the floor. So uh, uh, when we go through uh, uh, the model and uh, what type of pricing are we looking at, uh, the, key, the key aspect here is that uh, there needs to be a price for the for the emissions which are causing global warming and the rise in uh, and the rise in the temperature, and the price that we agreed upon across sectors, we put a price tag of 100 uh, US dollars per ton of CO2 emitted. Uh, but then also we have a breakdown here of tax, especially for uh, coal uh, and oil, uh, as they are the the most uh, 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 fossil fuels that give uh, out uh, CO2 emissions. Um, but then, and where is this money going? We take the money also to subsidize the transformation. We talk about economic transformation, so we need to encourage the growth of uh, uh, renewable energy, uh, nuclear energy, and also the growth of new technologies, uh, shifting the economy into a whole new direction, and one that is based on uh, renewable energy, uh, and also the, the, we need to give, also give space for growth for the new different technologies that will shape uh, what the new, the new economic model uh, of the future. Uh, and also uh, a key aspect here is about uh, land use and for, uh, forestry, where we'll also be reducing them down uh, to 50%. Um, so this is, uh, this is the outcome, uh, outcome of our last run. We can see here, this is business as usual and where the world will be if everything stays the way it is. And this is a different world that is possible. If we implement this policy package, if every sector pulls their weight, we can actually reach the goal that we all want as, um, as countries, as stakeholders on the planet. Is it possible or are we just dreaming? Uh, when we went through, we did our research and we wrote that uh, a lot of countries are already doing that. There are different forms of carbon uh, taxes that are implemented in different countries in different forms. So it's not something new, it's not something that is right, but it's just out there. Uh, it needs to be uh, structured in a, a consensus manner between the different countries and everybody needs to pull the weight equally. We've seen how the debate has been going in all the different COPs. So it's, it does exist. Uh, and does it help the economy? Yes. Uh, we've uh, traced uh, here uh, several countries and you can see how uh, the connection between a, a carbon tax and also economic uh, growth, it, it is possible and it will be, it's not just a tax that is going to uh, uh, limit economic growth uh, of the world. Uh, and when it comes to, uh, does a carbon tax really uh, uh, impact uh, and cut emissions? We've, again, with the same uh, four countries, we've seen uh, that it is successful in limiting emissions in, in different countries that have implemented that. So imagine if we take this and roll it out uh, worldwide uh, in, in all different countries and with the different uh, commitments of the different uh, stakeholders. So uh, feasibility, um, why is it uh, so feasible and the feasibility is the strength of this uh, package 
And it's because we have a perfect balance between the key sectors, uh, stakeholder contentment. And uh, as you can see, all um, stakeholders are quite uh, content, uh, all stakeholders are quite content with this package. We only have the agriculture and land use sector, with, uh, which could potentially be against the imp uh, implementation of this pol uh, public policy uh, package. And in order to tackle this down, we have developed some measures. So, I'm going to finally talk about the stakeholders, the strengths, and the opportunities. One of the things that we have to realize, the strength of this package, is the fact that we are going to introduce a carbon tax that will, in the long run, actually cause benefits to the economy. And the next thing is that not only will it cause benefits to the economy, but it will cause a benefit to the economy while co causing the control for temperature, while causing uh, a sustainable mechanism for the world to move forward on. And also the fact is that the opportunities is not what, the way we are looking at the project is the fact that as you saw the agriculture and the land use, the con contentment was quite low, but that is an opportunity. The fact is that what, with the survey that we and the research that we have done, we saw that the things that are still unaccounted for can be worked on in the time that we have after the package is on its way to make sure that these facets are incorporated in the work that we do. And actually, over the span of 85 years that we're talking about, we give them the benefits and the equal benefits that all the other sectors have been sharing. So we are keeping each and every sector in mind while we are talking about this project. While we are stakeholders as to who has a key role to play. So the opportunities are the ones who are not as content as the others. But the other thing is that the fossil fuel industry, without their consent and support, we can never move forward. And we have achieved that in this present plan and package, which is a significant step forward for the industry uh, that we are talking about and for each and every one of our countries. Finally, I would like to move on. Um, finally, I would like to talk about the implementation timeline. As we all well know that it is uh, the final product would be achieved in the year 2100, but the breakthrough years are between today and in the year 2020. Uh, so finally, I would bring the presentation to a close by reiterating what we have told you in the course of this presentation. One is that we will have a sustainable growth in the next 85 years. Secondly, we will have a carbon tax. And thirdly, we will shift the focus from fossil fuels to sustainable and renewable energy with the collaboration of the fossil fuel industry so that we incorporate all the sectors that are present and are a part of this package. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Team A. The floor is open for questions. I see a lot of positivism in the in the presentation, which is kind of like admirable. Uh, you emphasize um, about the consensus between actors and the importance of the economy. But I would like to be a little bit realistic, and I would and please let me ask you: in case of an economic crisis like we were uh, living through the last years, how do you think this may affect the feasibility of your project, and how would you would your team deal with this? So actually, uh, that was a question that came up when we were discussing the packaging of this, pro uh, of this deal. The thing that has uh, come up with the simulation and with the results we have is our GDP growth is actually at 1.7% with a 1.9 temperature. Now with this growth, as you can see before, if you remember before the economic crisis hit, the GDPs were soaring and there was a lot of this uh, imbalance between different nations. What we have is a 1.7 growth, which means a steady growth over a long span of time, which would control for a lot of the uh, fluctuations in the market and would ensure that this project can actually be implemented properly. So we're taking a conservative approach when it comes to projections for GDP growth. That's how we counteract for an economic downturn. Uh, thank you for the presentation. 
At the end, you mentioned that your the time frame for the breakthroughs is 16 to 20. Yes. 2020. Isn't that a bit too optimistic? It's going to be like four years left for all the research breakthroughs. Well, when we uh, when we consider the various possibilities we have at hand and the infrastructural level of the different sectors that we are looking at, uh, it was actually found feasible to have the breakthroughs between 2016 and 2020. Now, uh, with the breakthrough, of course, the years differ for the various industries, but uh, especially it's more significant for the sustainable energy sector because of the tax allocation that we have shifted from uh, fossil fuels to sustainable energy. It is actually being made possible that this sector can have the infrastructural level of development to make the breakthrough uh, feasible by 2020. And then this question is a question of maturity of technologies when it comes to energy production, electricity production. So, uh, and uh, if you move, uh, the fossil industry is heavily subsidized and we've seen the stats that, have became, uh, that came out. And actually today, today already, wind energy and solar energy are competitive when you remove the subsidies that are going to fossil. So imagine if these subsidies are also directed to uh, renewable energy sources. So not only will be the competitive, they would actually make a, a lot more sense than uh, having an economy based on run by fossil fuel. We have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, first of all, very nice presentation. Um, but I just want to ask that, uh, what kind of methodologies you're going to use? For you talk about cooperation. You talk about doing some uh, applying some uh, sustainable technologies. But I was missing some part. Of it. How are you going to do? But what would be the methodologies you will adapt to? And reach your goal. So uh, it's a it's a bit of a let's say it's a it's a broad question. Uh, so I decide I'll I'll use an example uh, to simplify things. Uh, the implementation implementation of each technology depends on each country, right? And uh, and which renewable energy source would be more uh, suitable to the local reality? Example: Egypt is on the on the solar belt, so uh, and also North Africa. So it makes a lot of sense that we we really push uh, solar energy there. And then when it comes to countries uh, like Denmark and Western Europe, when it comes to onshore and offshore wind turbines, that's where you roll that out. And, and or we've seen the examples already as we speak today. We've seen it uh, with the London array, we've seen it in Denmark, we've seen all the offshore turbines. Uh, and actually, uh, even countries like China today, they are the number one country when it comes to investment in renewable energy in the year, in the, just in the past year. So, but which technology did they implement? It depends on the reality of each country. So yes, it has to be, uh, this agreement needs to be uh, localized for each country and what works for the reality. Thank you very much. Thank you.